So I'm here to introduce the next speaker, very well known, I'm sure, to all of you. She comes from United Kingdom. She's a professor of psychiatry. Uh, she founded the first center for eating disorders. And uh, in 2013, she was awarded with the, uh, she was awarded officer of the Order of uh, British Empire. So it's uh, very well known. Um, she will talk about uh, something on either disorder. The title is uh, Time is of Essence in Eating Disorder. Please. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you, Anne, and all the committee for inviting me. Uh, and it's really pleasing to be here to see how the other half lives. So I've really enjoyed myself. Throughout my career, I've always looked at what's going on in schizophrenia and then thought, oh, we could do that. <laughs> uh, first of all, I just want to say, I acknowledge a lot of the figures I'm going to use in my talk come from a patient who's worked with me over time developing materials for patients and carers. And I suppose I'm a rather a visual person and it works well with language to have images. So I'm using many of the images we have for training. Uh, so disclosures, I am going to be talking about a book that I've written and these are other ones. So apologies to be coming as a stranger into uh, this area, but you know, picking up this theme of transdiagnostic, and I think that this slide is perhaps gives me an entrance here because these are correlation, recent correlations uh, with the genetic profile, and you can see that with the anorexia does overlap with schizophrenia to, to a degree, it's a bit better, the data coming out with obsessive compulsive disorder. But what you can see, of course, is not only have we got overlap with psychiatric, but we've got overlap with the somatic areas. So we've got uh, a negative correlation with the factors leading to high weight and all the metabolic syndrome as well, which is quite interesting to be understood more. Uh, so why I came here was Pat kindly came to the Institute and uh, gave a wonderful talk and I went up to him afterwards and said, I think eating disorders are a wonderful example of the need for early intervention. So in a way he threw the gauntlet down to me to be able to describe this. So I'm going to develop the case for this uh, today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the evidence for a staging model in eating disorders and go through several assumptions that follow from that. And then I'm going to talk about the problems of barriers uh, to early intervention and how we're thinking of ways of solving uh, these barriers. So, first of all, you perhaps need to show that duration of illness really is an important prognostic factor. Now, we've had a lot of data from Denmark uh, in this conference, so I've got data from Denmark as well, uh, which I think illustrates uh, this fact nicely. So you can see these are years of illness and remission, and you can see in the initial phase, we're getting quite a steep curve. Uh, but then by about 10 years, it sort of flattens off and we get very little recovery after that time. So when we do studies in the early phase, we can get 80%, 60 to 80% recovery after a year. When we do a, a, a study of people who've had it for 12 years, we don't get any recovery. We might get a bit of social recovery, but in terms of physical health, we get very little. And uh, so systematic reviews show that duration of illness is a big, important prognostic factor. What about neuroprogression? Well, I think it's probably clear cut to understand the mechanism of neuroprogression uh, in a disorder that causes huge problems with nutrition. Uh, so what's the evidence? 
Uh, so these slides just illustrate some of the work done on the brain, and they're not... Um, it'd be lovely to have longitudinal studies, but this... Uh, a study here is from the Imogen project, so a very large project of adolescents uh, and looking at a variety of um, problem behaviours. Uh, and what they found was that they could cluster together OCD uh, and eating disorders in the same sort of uh, personality style. And also they did, when they combined these and did scans at age of 14 with those with early signs of eating disorder, we found in, there was increased brain size in various areas of the, the frontal cortex and the striatum. Whereas down here you get the brain of somebody who's had it for 15 years. You know, the whole brain is very shrunken, but we do get specific areas that are particularly affected the cerebellum, uh, the striata, uh, the substantia nigra, uh, and the mesencephalon. So we do see this huge effect on the brain. When we look at the function of the brain, so if we give the same sort of stimuli to the brain in adolescents with a short illness and then to adults with a longer illness, uh, this is body image uh, stimuli, you can see that the difference between the anorexics and the healthy controls gets bigger over time. So the same image causes a bigger activation uh, in these people who've had a more chronic illness. And what I use for teaching uh, is to describe this very much as a snowball. Uh, that with severe enduring illness, you're getting more and more symptoms over time because of the problems of uh, poor nutrition. So I've talked about the brain shrinkage. I've talked about uh, the difference in activation to various salient images. When you look at reward functioning, that changes. Social functioning, that changes. Uh, depression, that changes over time. And I think this image uh, of what happens uh, by Elise is very nice, this gradual accumulation of more and more problems and more rules, habits. And we're getting, like the snowball, the slippery slide of habits that are very difficult uh, to change with the later illness. So does this change in the needs and the psychopathology mean that the response to treatment differs? Well, um, I think that in our area, perhaps we were the earliest to show this, I mean, you'll probably argue with me, uh, but to show how duration is a key factor. But I, when I turned up at the Maudsley to train in psychiatry, 35-ish years ago, this seminal study was in place. So it was a study that was changing the belief system of treatment of anorexia, which was following girl, what you do, admit them, get the weight up to normal, homeostasis will take over, all will be well. But it was realized that wasn't the truth, that people relapsed. Uh, and so this trial was set up to, to examine different sorts of psychotherapy to stop relapse after inpatient care. And uh, the two therapies were family therapy or individual therapy. And that's uh, Gerald Russell who designed the study there at the Maudsley. Now, what was clever at that time when this study was devised was that Russell obviously had an implicit staging model in mind uh, because the patients were randomized in groups, sort of stratified according to stage. So we had a group who were under 18, who'd had the illness for less than three years. Then we had the group developed it under 18, but had it more than three years. And then we had a group who developed it after the age of 18. So what are the outcomes from these different groups? Well, the outcomes were very different. So this is the early onset group. 
Uh, and to the right shows is a favoring of family therapy. So in this early onset case and short, family therapy is superior, and there was good results, sort of 50 to 60% recovery at one year, and that progressed for five years. However, when people had had it for over three years, uh, it didn't make any difference whether it was family therapy, individual therapy, none of them did well, both at the uh, one, one year and at five years later. Uh, the older group almost did better with the uh, individual therapy, but it did overlap uh, with the base, uh, with the uh, base line. Uh, and this was a quite a mixed group. So I think you can see that sort of early on, you know, family therapy works. Now, what's been happening since during my career, uh, since everybody was admitted? Well, we've been trying not to admit everybody. We have been trying to do outpatient studies. And that was very much helped by seeing that the family could help. So that started us in adolescence. But we're, we've been working with ad adults now. And this just shows data from a recent study that we've done at the Maudsley comparing two psychological treatments for anorexia nervosa. So this is set in outpatients now. Uh, so BMI of 16.6, .6, age 26, so these are mainly adults, and have mainly had eight years of illness. And we were comparing two sorts of psychotherapy. Uh, this is the consort diagram. Uh, it was a multi-center study. Um, and we were able to recruit a reasonable proportion for saying people with anorexia noted not to want to engage in treatment. And we managed to get quite good levels of follow-up with one death uh, during the study. Uh, when we look at the data according to duration, so whether they've had over three years or less than three years, you can see that we get much better results in this adult population if they've had the illness less than this magic three years, uh, both for the Maudsley type of treatment and for the specialized supportive treatment. So it isn't just in the early stage, it's also in this older stage we get a staging effect. So we're getting a good response to these sort of therapies, family-based treatment, mantra, SSCM, uh, and poor response to anything when it's gone on for a long time. But there's lots of uncertainties. Um, is three years, I mean, I don't know why Gerald Russell took it out of his hat. Is that a good figure? Would 10 years, like the slope, be better? Um, but also with eating disorders, we do have to consider severity uh, is very important, the amount of weight loss. And so this is uh, data just come from a recent multi-center study in a, a large number of adolescent units. And you're going to see a bit more about this study later across the UK. So here you are, you can see the type of case we have here, 16 0.9, they all had to be under 21, their body mass index was 17, and they'd had about a year of illness. And in fact, the intervention is a care intervention, but that's not relevant to this, because what I'm showing you is, is over time, the year we followed them, the changes in their BMI. And this is the individual traje uh, trajectories of each patient. And this is a randomized cluster, fancy statistical method of looking at the clusters that occur. Um, and the main predictors of these clusters are duration of illness is one, but of course BMI, uh, the initial BMI, uh, is important. And you can see people who start off with this BMI at about 15 do nothing really without patient care. Uh, whereas those who are quite mild, we can get quite a good response early on. And these we get a slow but sure gradual improvement over time. 
Um, so people have been very interested in this idea that we can predict what's going to happen early on because our treatments tend to be long. I mean, our mantra is 20 sessions on average, but CBTE is 40 sessions. So, you know, things take a long time with eating disorders. And so can we predict and personalize treatment uh, based on the early response? Well, maybe we can and switch. And there's a lot of studies that have now confirmed how important this early response is, whether it's uh, treatment for bulimia, binge eating, whether it's inpatient care for anorexia, whether it's outpatient care for anorexia. So then the final um, hypothesis is that we're going to get with these changing needs and the progression of the pathology, we're going to get a change in response of carers over time and peers. So uh, going back to the snowball uh, metaphor, one thing we know from Dunbar's work is how much of brain power is devoted to social cognition. You know, he shows sort of nice correlations between the size of the brain and the social network. And what we find is we get huge problems in social cognition that are very related to weight. So uh, people don't express emotions, they don't recognize emotions, they, they are in a high threat state. So we get many changes in the acute stage of the illness. And I think this quote uh, is uh, very nice. This is from a psychiatrist who had anorexia when she was 11. And she wrote her personal journey uh, and she said, if I have to talk about it in one word, it would be isolation. So this highlights a theme that's been coming up a lot uh, in this conference, how much the social factors make a difference. So as we're going down this hill, we're getting more problems uh, with the social situation. Uh, and you can see that we can think of stages of caregiving and the reaction of carers. So when Hilda Brook wrote about eating disorders, well, anorexia, there was often the case that these were good little girls. They were very perfectionist, did very well. Uh, and so then it was a real shock when the illness developed uh, and there was a lot of panic, shame and stigma in this early phase uh, with the illness. But then over time you get ad adaptations with the family uh, and what we find is we get accommodating and enabling behaviors from the family as well as high expressed emotion that you're more uh, knowledgeable about. Uh, and so uh, these images sort of describe how the family get bullied by the anorexia living amongst them uh, and change many behaviours. Or they may enable the eating disorder by taking away some of the secondary consequences or, or giving money to go and uh, binge. So there's a variety of ways. So, and it's very understandable why families would accommodate. Uh, it's a reaction to anxiety, and they are terrified she's going to die. Uh, and so they bend over backwards uh, to change in whatever way they can. Uh, and it, there's many rituals about food and meals and crockery, who eats what, where it's put, what you can have, etc. how many. The safety behaviors, the exercise regimes, Parents can get caught up in those. Variety of OCD behaviors. There's often calibration and competition with other family members. I'm not going to eat more than my three-year-old sister, or uh, you've got to eat, finish all your food off, otherwise I'm not going to, etc. Uh, and removing these negative consequences. 
And then expressed emotion, that's sort of standard, and, and we get this too. And these are the metaphors that we use to describe this uh, for our family members. So we discuss kangaroo care uh, with the problem that although you're, overprotect, you're overprotecting the person with the eating disorder, but in the pouch, you've got the anorexia too. So that keeps the anorexia going. Similarly, the rhino response, the more you're in head-to-head -head conflict, you must eat, uh, the more that fires up the anorexic voice, g giving all the reasons not to, uh, and that battle begins. So explaining to families how to try and avoid uh, these sort of behaviours is important. Uh, and this just so shows some data, and I'm going to show you more of this data, but this uh, just shows this adolescent sample, so you can see their level of accommodating at baseline, and it increases with standard treatment by six months. So this is something that does develop over time. Similarly, uh, this is carer's distress, uh, often you can get this escalation and mirroring of, uh, of distress within the family. Uh, and with treatment as usual, which in the UK now, following the NICE guidelines, is family treatment. Uh, but you can see that the carer distress goes up over time. So I'm going to switch now. I hope I've presented my case that early intervention and thinking of staging is really important for eating disorders. Um, I'm now going to set the case for thinking the size of the problem and what are we going to do about it. So this is a study of community prevalence of eating disorders in southeast London. Uh, and uh, you can see that about 10% of this community approach population had e eating disorder behaviors in the year prior to the interview, mainly females. However, less than 20% go for treatment. And that's a figure that in epidemiological studies in the US and elsewhere is consistent. It's about 20% go on for treatment. This data is quite interesting, as the stereotypes of a white middle-class girl uh, aren't really met, the thin girl, is that we do see a higher proportion in ethnic minorities, especially the Asian group. Uh, they're all sh shapes and sizes. It isn't just thin people now. People with obesity often will have binge eating disorder, uh, but we do still have more females. So then the next stage is presentation to primary care. Uh, so this is the 20% that go there. Uh, and when we've, been, we've been looking at this over decades, and the anorexia remains very constant. The decade before this, bulimia nervosa was increasing, but that's stabilized. But what we're seeing increasing over this last decade is binge eating disorder increasing. And you can see the median age that these develop, 16 for anorexia, 18 a bit later for bulimia. You've got to have a bit of autonomy to be able to go out and buy binge foods and do all the secretive behaviors, and then binge eating disorder a bit later on. So what are the barriers uh, to care? Well, we do have a lot of patient-related barriers, this ambivalence about uh, getting help, the shame, the stigma, and the uh, valuing of the disorder, and the not wanting to go to health services. We've got primary care barriers, with only 50% being recognized, and then few of those being referred on. Uh, when they get referred on, there's huge delays before they're started to be seen and for assessment and treated. And then we can have very um, perverse commissioning and set up of services, uh, which vary. I mean, the split, when I started with Gerald Russell, we had a sort of trans age, but it sort of got rigidly separated uh, recently. Um, 
But some services only take people less than a BMI of 16, so you're not ill enough to come to our service. And others only take people over 16. We don't want to take the risk of... So it's per absolutely perverse. And so, of course, all of these factors lead to a very long duration of untreated illness. And most of the data comes from Germany, showing about two years at least uh, before people start treatment. Uh, our audit showed a bit less than this, so the NHS isn't so bad, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> uh, now, how to deal with this awareness and these early stages of going in treatment? Well, there's been a lot of great work, and I, can't, I haven't got time to go through it. I think one of the most amusing, or well, not pleasing, is the impetus amongst girl guides to get them more aware of eating disorders and the prevention and even getting a badge for, for doing this early prevention work. So that's nice. But Dove, um, the cosmetics, uh, soap uh, manufacturer, getting very involved in this area. And I do rather like this quote by Naomi Wolf saying, you know, that image, body image has replaced sex as the neurotic focus you know, of the last few centuries. What about, though, patient-related barriers? This is something that we have to contend with quite a lot. Uh, and this is a very nice image by a neuroscientist who had anorexia. And this is a, a, a picture she drew whilst in inpatient. Uh, and what you can see is the anorexia here, sort of levering away the blob of fear uh, that she is terrified of. And the fears relate to people, others, and life. So there she is, uh, protected by the anorexia, uh, safe but trapped. So I think that's a nice image. And we know how valued eating disorder behaviors are because we get these pro-anorexia websites springing up all the time. And no matter how hard the servers try and close them, they spring up again. So how can we overcome this? How can we improve engagement uh, and work to get change? Well, this shows our cognitive interpersonal model, and I'm not going to go through that in detail. You don't need to know it. But uh, wanting to show where we've been thinking, where can we lever change? So we have all these interpersonal problems that develop, and we've got anorexia and the problem of motivation. So it's always a good idea to go through a door that's open. And so going through, working through families who are very motivated to have change, does seem a good idea. So that's what we've been very interested in doing, not just in the young ones, but trying to get an approach that's appropriate for young adults too, because we know that, that uh, early, the, the, the family therapy used 35 years ago it didn't really work across the age spectrum. So we've been developing um, uh, information and skill sharing to carers where we discuss these secondary changes, discuss the problems of accommodation which uh, occur in most families, the problems of overprotection and uh, hostility and criticism uh, that easily spring up with the frustration of, you know, or, all you have to do is eat. So we have, we've been able, with a change of funding in the NHS, to get studies where we can get recruitment from lots of centres, but we don't have much money for the therapy because you have to get the money from the therapy from the local area. You just can't get it. But you can often get people to play with you. Uh, and so we've been able to get all these outpatient centres willing to give us cases. And so these are the, oh, these cases. So our intervention, because we have no money for it and no money for supervision, etc., has to be very basic. 
Uh, and what we've done is, and so this is a spoiler, well, not spoiler alert, but this is conflict of interest. I've written this book with a medical student, now a doctor, who'd had an illness and a carer. Um, we gave slides. And we either gave coaching with somebody who'd recovered uh, or, uh, well, somebody's family who'd, member who'd recovered uh, or some graduate uh, psychologist. Uh, and so we, they, patients were divided into three. So some had treatment as usual, some had just the self-help interventions, and some had the coaching as well. And they were followed at six and 12 months. So what happened to the carers? Because this was focused at trying to change the carer's behavior. Uh, and this shows accommodating, the being bullied. And you can see that those who got the echo, that both groups, didn't change very much. Whereas those not having anything extra, they were probably having family therapy, uh, their accommodating increased over time. You've seen this. Not a big effect, but something, some signal. Expressed emotion, we got a sort of similar thing that decreased in the echo group, didn't change in the treatment as usual group, but a very small effect. Uh, what about the carer outcomes themselves? So looking at carer distress, uh, a decrease in the echo, the group given these simple in, uh, interventions, uh, whereas um, it's the distress increased, small effect again in the treatment as usual. What about the patient's outcomes? Because our idea was that if we could change the carer's behavior, we might get knock-on effects to the patient's behavior. Sounds a bit far-fetched, but still. Uh, and this shows the outcomes divided into severity, moderate and severe severity, based on their weight. And not much difference between the two groups if they were mild. Whereas, I hope with my gaze of optimism, you see that there seems to be a bit of a signal that the groups given the echo, which are the white circles, did slightly better for these more severe cases. This shows admission rates uh, and the treatment as usual, 16%. These were 12%. So in the right direction, but not sig significant. What we did find uh, was significant in the, in the patients was their social behavior. And we found that the number of peer problems decreased uh, and their pro-social behaviors increased. So uh, these, are, these are things with the SD that did change. When we looked at the adherence to this intervention, because we'd given it before in a form like this to adults in patients, we were very disappointed with our adherence rate in these adolescents, because you can see we only got about 30% that reading half of the book. I mean, the book's quite long and it has a few chapters, but it's still rather disappointing. Uh, and our DVDs, which again, were not professionally made, these were made by us and they include PowerPoint. We, again, they didn't really watch many of those. Uh, in the groups having guidance, it was slightly better, uh, but not very much. So it's quite interesting that this uh, intervention wasn't implemented as well as we'd have liked, and yet we were still picking up some signals. So we got low adherence, uh, and it was, had been much better when we'd had adults who've probably had very little family therapy in the past. Um, so uh, those who had extra comorbidity with depression did adhere more also. So what about uh, motivation? Can we do more for this? Um, There has been talk that you can't really add extra or add self-help or uh, guided management to anorexia. They're, they're not the patient group you comply it to. But we were interested in being able to add something to improve motivation. 
And so we went back to theory uh, and theories of motivation. So the, the self-determination theory is interesting. So it, it indicates that by increasing autonomy and self-competence, and so our belief in sharing materials, sharing videos, uh, sharing workbooks is a way of improving this aspect uh, of treatment. And another domain that's important for this motivation model is increasing relatedness. And so how we did this, we had, in order to counteract the pro so we had recovery tips, little videos from people who'd recovered from anorexia describing how they did it, what steps they took. Uh, so I think we've got about 90 to 100 little a little uh, motivational moments. We found this, we'd done fancy CBT, and the patients always, the ratings of our work versus hearing genuine experiences, uh, that the, the latter were much more preferred. Uh, so this is a, a project we're doing now to see if we can add a, a guided self-help management to help the patients at this early stage so very much trying to get uh, patients who've recovered into the picture. S some of those do the guidance uh, with us, although I'm not totally sure about the sustainability of that. So these are the podcasts we have, these little videos of uh, recovery moments, and then very much a behavioral reflection, being aware of what you're doing, plan for change, and try it. So just encouraging uh, behavior change all the time. Uh, and so we are comparing uh, treatment as usual, but with giving feedback, sort of doing assessments and saying, thank you very much, you've got so-and-so on your so-and-so or whatever, which they like as well, uh, and it keeps them in. So they're, they're often quite pleased of just having that minimal intervention uh, versus one that's a bit more... Uh, labor intensive, but trying to be very much a more improving self management. Uh, and we're still, this is work in progress, but we are seeing medium sized changes uh, between groups in the importance of changing motivation and the alliance. Uh, so this is sort of quite pleasing that you can target these. So some of the feedback we have. You can see uh, my mentor was wonderful, felt understood, reading the workbooks and watching the videos, but she was asking the right questions. Just saying it's too short, should be offered to all people, no point doing it if they're not ready. Well, that, that's, that's what we're trying to overcome. Uh, you have to study the videos and resources carefully and think about the exercises and to make efforts to change. I found the six weeks of help, uh, the questionnaires, the one-to-one, -one. look forward to the future and building blocks to work on. Um, I'm saying thank you. Uh, battling with the illness, uh, so saying how important the online support was. So again, agreeing with the last talk, how important these new technologies are going to be at approaching our patients. So, trying new things, and just being good enough. That process is her new motto. So, uh, I've taken you rather a whistle-stop tour of eating disorders, and I hope I've pleaded a, a good case that eating disorders should be considered something that really would benefit from early intervention, and that a staging model is highly appropriate to this patient group. I've shown you how... Uh, duration impacts on prognosis. I've shown you some of the neuroprogression, but you can imagine the rest of it. It's not really rocket science, is it? Uh, the changes that we see and expect. I've shown you how we have treatment resistance uh, over t uh, if the illness has lasted for a long while, um, and that we eat to all sorts of treatments. Uh, and the barriers we have, particularly, are this uh, reluctance to accept the sick role. So we're very dependent on tutors at university, 
parents to get patients to come for treatment. Uh, but I do think, rather like the theme of this clinic, sort of improving social support is the way to go uh, and, and giving information. So there's a, a charity called Student Minds that has buddies supporting students at university with eating disorders. But we've really, I think we've got the materials, but we need to think of how to implement these materials. So these echo materials were very much done as workshops uh, uh, face to face, and so sort of translating how we can disseminate those better is something we have to do. And so just thank you to all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very much. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first uh, lecture um, on the uh, eating disorders in this uh, conference. Um, we could recognize how the early intervention is important for also in early inter uh, eating disorders, this biological and social disorder. Thank you very much. <laughs>